have never stood in one of these. <laughs> so please, keep me company here. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. I almost tripped on the way up. Whoa, can you hear me all right? I'm so happy to be here, although I must say it is it's humbling to stand in this. And thank you for Amazing Grace. The new documentary about Aretha Franklin is called Amazing Grace, and it's out now, just came out last Friday. So let's all go see it. And thank you, Scott, for mentioning Stanley Kunitz. Does anybody here know his work at all, Stanley Kunitz? You do? Stanley um, wrote famously, I only borrowed this dust. Dust is a great place for me to start today. Um, I want to share with you an experience I've been having for the last three years. I teach poetry at Sarah Lawrence College, and I've been teaching for a very long time. Um, and like many of you, I have been increasingly alarmed by what's happening to the living world around us and how it's at a point of crisis. So I began to teach eco-poetry. Has anyone ever heard that term before, eco-poetry? It's an odd term. Um, but it, it was a way for me to begin to learn more about the world, which I know very little about. Most lyric poetry for centuries has concerned itself with the human plight. I'm sad. I'm lonely. I'm in love. You know, I'm worried. I want to win this war. Our country is great. You know, poetry has always done that. But I really firmly believe now it's time for the voice and poetry to step from the center and to allow the other animals in. And by other animals, I mean, well, all the microbes that are in our bodies, too, and are on our faces and in our gut. I mean, now we have just recently learned that we are actually more microbes than we are us. Do you know that? I just learned that. We are more microbes. And no, it's hard to believe. Look it up. We're more microbes than we are us. We should say, really, my microbes are happy to meet your microbes <laughs> when we meet each other. And all these microbes, oh, thank you, Heidi. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you, love. All these microbes, you know, of course, have a life of their own, and they too feel as if they are the center of the world. So even though we were writing poetry, we also took on learning. We read a book called Dirt, which I highly recommend to you. It's by William Logan, and it's about dirt. It's about the actual earth, and one of the things we learned right off is where dirt comes from. Does anybody know? I mean, people said, oh, from rocks, from this, from that. But way back, way back, way back, when the earth was just beginning to form, and it was a molten ball of heat and metal, there was no dirt on it. And what happened, this is the most amazing thing. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the universe, stars are exploding, as they are now. Stars are exploding, and the detritus of these stars is moving through the cosmos, moving through the cosmos, and eventually clumping when it finds more of itself. When the Earth began to cool, it pulled that detritus from exploding stars to it, and it's eventually coated with that stardust. We actually are made of stardust. And we are made of stardust, and the horse is made of stardust, and the pew is made of stardust. Everything that is on this planet is actually made from blown up stars. Joni Mitchell was right. Remember the song? We are stardust. We are golden. Um, just taking that in, we understand what Walt Whitman was saying when he says, I celebrate myself. And what, what I assume you shall assume, for every atom belonging to me as well belongs to you. Eco-poetry has taught me that every atom belonging to me as well belongs to the rat and to the mosquito, and to the hawk, and to the coral reef. Um, what we did was that 
we decided every semester each student would learn something about the living world and then teach us about it. So everyone chose a subject. And I often asked people to choose a subject that didn't appeal to them. So for example, Amy Hong, who was a wonderful writer in my class and my assistant at school, I said, what is the aspect of the living world that upsets you? And she said, spiders. I can hardly say the word. And I said, will you learn about spiders? And she did. And she taught us about spiders. And slowly, she allowed the spiders to come into her poems, first as a metaphor, then as an actual spider. And then finally, the spider got to tell us a little bit more about what it was like to be a spider. We learned that spiders have eight eyes. We learned that spiders do not have muscles to move their legs like we do. They move their legs hydraulically. You know, so many things we've learned. Somebody else learned about coral reefs. Now, I didn't know much about coral reefs, except that they're being destroyed, right? We learned that coral reefs, maybe you know this already, so forgive me if I'm saying, telling you what you already know, but they're animals. Who knew? A coral reef is an animal. And once a year, coral reefs can't see, but they can discern light and dark. And get this, once a year, when the moon is full, the coral reefs, all at once, release their sperm and eggs. One night a year. Don't you want to be there for that? I do. And when there's different kinds of coral reef in the same area, they wait a half an hour so that their sperms and eggs won't get all mixed up. Um, we began to question the language we use. Because I'm a writer, I know how crucial it is to be careful about how we speak. So we, had, we spent a week talking about the word nature. When we say nature, what does that imply? That nature's here and we're here. But in fact, we are nature. When we say the animals, it implies we're not an animal. We are an animal. And for centuries, we were a very unessential animal until we had our cognitive revolution and then became the most ferocious pred predator on the planet. So we decided never to use the word nature again. So what do you say instead of nature when you want to say everything? We came around to saying the living world because we began to realize that the living world is all connected. The trees, we also, of course, recently learned about trees. Trees are all talking to each other. We didn't know that either, right? 10 years ago, we didn't even know. There's fungi in between the root systems, and trees feed each other and help each other. They even feed trees that are not of their, their type. An oak tree will feed a maple if it needs more sugar. It's extraordinary. The whole world is interdependent relationships. I feel as if in this course, we move from Genesis, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous book, and the creation of the world, but which I believe many people have misinterpreted to mean I actually heard a senator a month ago on the radio quote from Genesis arguing for drilling in the Arctic saying, we are here to dominate. We have dominion. And I'm talking to the radio going, no, no, I don't think that's what anybody meant. But So we move in some ways from Genesis to Martin Buber. Remember Mar Martin Buber? He wrote that book that changed so many of our lives called I and Thou. I, Thou. He said there's two kinds of relationships, I, It, and I, Thou. When we have an I, It relationship, we are diminished. When we have a relationship with someone or something, I use that word lightly, that is because we want something from that person or thing, it's often an it. But when we have an I-thou relationship, the only way to have it is to summon the fullness of our being to encounter the fullness of being of that other. And God is there in that encounter and in that relationship. I really believe the world is God. 
that the living world, all the interconnections, that black hole we just saw in the newspaper, the photograph, that looks so frightening to us, God, all of it's God. And if all of it's God, and we learn about these other animals and entities, I really believe we will change our consciousness, and we will not want to hurt them anymore. When you love something, you don't want it to be hurt. And what I love about that Job, when that voice from the whirlwind, it's the first eco poem. That voice that says, tell me if you know about the ostrich. Tell me if you know about the hawk. And it empathizes with these animals and their labor, giving birth, getting food, bringing the food back to their babies, having their babies grow and leave them, you know? There's this tremendous empathy with the experience of these animals, that, these other animals, that forces us to identify with them, not only with the voice that says, I created them, but with the other created beings themselves. I know I don't know what time it is. Oh, Lordy, it's already so late. Um, so I wanted to read you just three poems. Is there time for that? I want to read you an example of one of the poems of my students. This is Andre Topak. And he lives near Central Park, and he watched every day. He went out to watch a kingfisher that had come to the, one of the ponds in Central Park. And this is the poem's a series of questions. And um, I think you'll understand what happens as you begin to hear the questions. Do you know what a kingfisher is? Do you like birds? Have you ever had a meaningful encounter with one? What did you think? Did you wish you could fly? How far would you go? Would you look back for even a second? Who are you? Why do you stare at me? Weren't you taught that it's rude to stare? Do you notice the neon blue feathers on my back? Are you planning on plucking them to sell? are put on display? Does my beak impress you? What brought you here? Were you wandering? What did you see? Why are you sitting? Are you tired? Did you spend the morning hunting? Had you gone to bed hungry the night before? Are you scanning the area for a meal now? Am I in danger? Would you tell me if I was? Why do you carry a weapon? Would you do harm to another creature? Do you destroy your surroundings? Does this bring you joy? Would you stop? Is that why you're resting? Why do you take part? Are you being forced? It's not my home that I'm worried about. Is it because you need to rebuild? Did the flood carry away your home too? Are your children gone as well? Do you look forward to the summer like I do? Does flooding water mean the same to you as it does to me? Are poisoned fish on your mind at all? Would you eat a fish that's been in the sun all day? Do you notice the color of its scales? I mean, when I first read this, I thought, he was talking to me, Andre, but then I slowly realized it's the kingfisher talking, right? Why are you sitting? Is it because you're tired? Have you been hunting all morning? We were talking about um, a monastery up on Hudson, the Hudson called Holy Cross. And um, I go there sometimes when I need to quiet down. And when I was there once, I was there during a great snowstorm that kept us all in the monastery overnight on New Year's Eve. It was the best New Year's Eve of my life. It was, those Episcopalians, they know how to eat, too. Not like the Catholics, which I grew up with. So remember the moment when, after Jesus has been murdered and then he comes back, and Thomas doesn't believe him. They, they, Thomas isn't around when he reappears to the apostles, and he says, yeah, I'll, when I put my hand in his side, and when I put it, my hand in his wound, I'll believe it. 
So that line, the line from that um, scripture is quoted in here. The snowstorm. I walked down toward the river, and the deer had left tracks deep as half my arm that ended in a perfect hoof. And the shump shump sound my boots made walking made the silence loud. And when I turned back toward the great house, I walked beside the deer tracks again. And when I came near the feeder, little tracks of the birds on the surface of the snow I had broken through. Put your finger here and see my hands, then bring your hand and put it into my side. I put my hand down into the deer track and touched the bottom of an invisible hoof, then my finger and the little mark of the J. And finally, um, I'll end with a poem that came to me after I really tried to understand Stephen Hawking, the great physicist who, who conceived of this idea that everything was once so compressed, everything that is, blew apart in what we call the Big Bang. But that original in hyper dense matter, which is smaller than the fingernail on my own, well, smaller than small, is called the singularity. And so um, here's a poem after Stephen Hawking called The Singularity. Do you sometimes want to wake up to the singularity we once were? So compact, nobody needed a bed, or food, or money. Nobody hiding in the school bathroom, or home alone, pulling open the drawers where the pills are kept. For every atom belonging to me as good belongs to you. Remember, there was no nature, no them, no test to determine if the elephant grieves her calf or if the coral reef feels pain. Trashed oceans don't speak English or Farsi or French. Would that we could wake up to what we were when we were ocean and before that to when sky was earth and animal was energy and rock was liquid and stars were space and space was not at all, nothing. Before we came to believe humans were so important, before this awful loneliness. Can molecules recall it? What once was before anything happened, no I, no we, no one, no was, no verb, no noun, only a tiny, tiny, tiny dot brimming with is, 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 all, everything, home. Thank you. Going